Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me tonight. It's an honor to be the one here representing Men and Center, but honestly, the work could not be done without the collaboration of our amazing staff, parents, our PTSA, which has been such a support to us, and of course, our assistant principal, Mark Puma. So thank you to everybody for your support with all of our hard work at Men and Center. So we spent last year laying the foundation for our PLC work, um, creating our shared vision, which is to unlock the potential of every child. Along with um, coming to understand the, dis the district's mission statement and then establishing some collective commitments for ourselves. This foundational work is so important because it allowed us to embrace a growth mindset for our children and align our practices in order to do what's best for kids. So we ground all of our beliefs and our actions in the work that we did last year. So as a result of this, we were ready to hit the ground running, and this year our focus is on um, creating a focus on learning, specifically answering the question, what do we want our students to learn, and how will we know if they've learned it? So we had to make some decisions about where to start with that work. So we began with our data from the 2016-17 school year. And as we drilled down in all the curricular areas, we found that math was an area in which we'd want to focus in terms of um, identifying essential standards and learning for students. So one piece of um, evidence that I'd like to share with you is our local assessment scores from the end of the year achievement test. And these are our current students. So you'll see grade one is only 60 because that was last year's kindergartners. We have more first graders than 60. Um, but you can see when the benchmark was set at 65, which was the bar for the achievement measure, we did very well. Um, high 80s, 90s, 100. Just to see what happened, we moved our benchmark to 80% and took a look at those percentages if we had lifted the benchmark to 80%. And what we found was actually very, a very different story. So this was kind of the impetus for our work um, in focusing on mathematics. In some cases, there was a difference as much as 20% in the amount of students achieving the benchmark if we were to move the benchmark to 80%. So that's what guided us in our decision making to focus on math. And that work began on Superintendent's Conference Day. Um, we agreed that we were going to establish power standards for every grade level. Those would be the standards that are the most essential to teach, that we would teach in depth, that we would, with no uncertainty, make sure that every student um, is proficient and successful with those standards before they move on to the next grade level. In order for a standard to be a power standard, it has to possess three things, endurance, leverage, and readiness. So when we talk about endurance, we're talking about will this standard have value beyond a single test date? Um, when we think about leverage, we're thinking about the standard's value in multiple disciplines. And when we think about readiness, we think about is this standard essential to prepare students for either the next unit of instruction or the next grade level? So those are the three criteria that were established for identifying power standards. And we began this work individually first. Teachers did it alone, then they got with their grade levels, and then we moved on to um, vertical teams. The power standards focused on prioritizing, not eliminating. So that's very important to mention. We're still teaching all the standards, but our power standards are those with which we're devoting most of our time and our interventions. Um, like I said, we looked at endurance, leverage, and readiness, and we also felt the need to test our thinking because we had experienced teachers identifying power standards based on what they knew of their curriculum and instruction and their kids, but we also needed another way to test our thinking and say, are we right on track with what we think are power standards? So we used four different resources to support us in um, checking our thinking. We looked at the district curriculum and the state standards, of course. Um, we looked at trend summary data for state assessments for the past four years. So BOCES was able to provide us with Melanie's help some great data that outlined which standards were addressed each year and how often. So that was another tool for us. Um, we looked at the end of the year local assessments for math because this summer teams had done a lot of work aligning those to the standards and what was essential. So we were matching there as well. And then we also went back to the park um, model content frameworks for mathematics that they came out with when Common Core first came out. They said 80% of your time should be on these priority standards. So we used those four resources to test our thinking along with our teachers' expertise, of course. 
So we created a document that is um, outlines our power standards for math. And by putting our standards in a format like this, we were very easily able to look vertically. So beyond Superintendent's Day, we then used faculty time and instructional leadership team time to get into vertical teams and look for any gaps, omissions, or overlaps. So we looked for things that might have shown up in grade two, not in grade three, was important in grade four. We looked at things that belonged there that weren't there at all, and we looked for things that were redundant that didn't need to be emphasized as often. Mm -hmm. So working on this document through um, Superintendent's Day, faculty meetings, instructional leadership team, by the end of November, we had a final draft of our power standards. So that leads us on to the next half of our work. This year, um, teams right now are working on unpacking each standard and putting it in kid-friendly language with learning targets, I can statements for our students. We're also um, developing the criteria for success. So along with each standard, teachers are peeling away all the prerequisite skills, but then also providing for students work samples, rubrics, and ways for them to know what it will look like when they've reached proficiency. So our kids can monitor um, their success and set some goals for their learning. Teams are also working on cognitive formative assessment measures, and that's not a big, long testing session, but it's more individual problems that kids might do as an exit ticket or as an individual activity to check for understanding. So how are we doing with our instruction around these standards? Are we aligned? Are the kids understanding what they need to learn? And what are the measures telling us? And then a lot of continued vertical collaboration and conversations, which has been really exciting because typically, Grades two to three and three to four have been huge leaps in mathematics, and it's great that these conversations are happening and we're tightening up um, those leaps for students. And here's just an example of a template that some of the teams were using to begin unwrapping um, the standards. So while we're doing a lot of work with academics and what we're expecting our students to learn and how we'll know it, we're also emphasizing social-emotional learning for our students. Last year in February, our fourth and fifth graders and all of our faculty and staff and our parents K-5 were invited to take the Culture of Ethics, um, Excellence in Ethics Assessment Survey, which really took a look at our school culture, how we were doing in terms of our students' um, involvement and achievement and safety and feeling around the building. Um, and we had a lot of great findings from that survey that's really dr driving our work as an SEL committee. For some of our strengths, we found that our faculty and staff have a trust and respect and commitment to their students and each other. Our parents feel it's a safe environment and that we're committed to maximizing the potential of every child. Areas of opportunity for us were um, increasing student involvement and leadership roles, increasing student voice within the building, and empowering them to make more decisions, and also helping kids to set goals and monitor their progress towards those goals. So while the academic work is around the mathematics, it also ties into the survey results around goal setting. We're, we're very clear on essential learning. Our kids understand that and can reflect in how they're um, progressing. When you think about student voice, I just want to share one neat thing. Um, a couple of students approached Mark Pumar, <laughs> assistant principal, with an interest of starting a football team during recess. And he empowered the kids to come up with a plan, and they involved the phys ed teacher. And um, we ended up with 11 five-man teams. This is all student-created. The kids made posters. They received all the sign-up communication. They set up the end zones and the foul lines and cleaned up the equipment at the end. Um, they managed their own games, and teams that were eliminated along the way actually came back repurposed as cheerleaders and <laughs> for the other kids. So it was really cool to see that it was a student-driven thing at recess that just grew and grew and was very positive. And they actually ended up with a commissioner um, for the tournament who did some signs at the end. They had a Super Bowl. It was a really, it was a really big deal. It's grown. Thankfully, it started snowing, so we could take a little breather from it, but we'll come back to it in the spring. Um, but there's nothing like empowering your kids and giving them a voice. And we were excited to have that opportunity this fall. Um, this is one of our reflections from one of our students after a Kindness Rocks project. This was a first grader who wrote about it and said, if you try to help others when they need help, you will feel happy and they will feel happy for you and for them. 
So um, any of our building initiatives around acceptance and kindness and anti-bullying, we're always trying to put in a piece of student reflection to that, whether it's kids talking about it in class discussions, reflecting in writing, sharing with their teachers, because we have to have a way to know the impact of our learning. A lot of our building initiatives have also been graciously supported by our PTSA. So we have, um, this fall we installed our first buddy bench that our PTSA purchased for us. And the idea behind the buddy bench is that nobody's lonely on the playground. And all of the teachers were given a common PowerPoint assessment that they showed to their kids. And um, guidelines for the use of the buddy bench were established and posted in every classroom and the cafeteria in the building. And the kids are excited to be using the buddy bench to um, combat any loneliness in the playground. Maybe you're a new student, maybe you have a friend that's not there, maybe you need to take a break from your peer group, um, but it's been a positive thing for us. And then I know you've heard about it, but we also did this fall our Kindness Rocks project where um, two fourth grade teachers, Kirsten Weeks and Kim Hasbach, found out about this national movement where you write kind messages on rocks and leave them at random places with the idea of spreading kindness one rock at a time. So the children have all made rocks for you. I gave Melanie the bag because I didn't want to take your time passing out rocks um, during the meeting, but you'll be excited to receive your rock <laughs> at the end of the presentation. They've been ready for you since November when I was originally scheduled to share with you. Um, and in addition to some of our bigger initiatives like this, our counselors continue to do monthly lessons in the classroom. And our SCL committee is really shifting our focus in this next half of this year around selecting principal books of the month for the rest of the year and into next year that deal with character development and also looking at some common vocabulary across the building to reinforce K-5 when we talk about things like our school promise um, spells out caring, um, kindness, trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, all of those good things. So we're off to a great start at Menon Center and thank you so much for the opportunity to share some highlights with you. Thank you, Heather. Does anybody have any questions? Heather, I just wanted to tell you, I've been out and about in the village in the library and at Starbucks just recently in the last couple months, and I saw several kids both times with rocks, and they were so excited. Yeah. It was so cute. They've been tweeting where they find them, and they've yeah. been found all over, like a school in Penfield and downtown, and it's been really exciting to see the tweets when they come. One rock made its way from outside the Strathallen all the way up to the rooftop in like four different tweets. So it's kind of <laughs> interesting to see the journey of the rock. Um, but the kids are still very much invested in that and wanting to do more and anxious for all the snow and cold to be gone so they can resume their rock placing in the spring. So. Thank you again for all of your support. Thank you so much, and thank you for the coffee you had a couple months ago. We enjoyed it. Enjoyed having you there. Thank you. Heather, if the superintendent's lonely, can he sit on the buddy bench? Absolutely. <laughs> I often go sit out there, but then, but then they all want to talk to me, and then I go back inside. I'm just kidding. No, but um, no, the adults had some fun when we installed the buddy bench for skits and things we could do, but it's been a lot of fun. And the kids, it was neat. When we put it out there, we hadn't given any instruction. We just wanted to see what would happen those first couple days, and the kids really acclimated very quickly, figuring out the role of the bench. So. Um, now with instruction, they're even better, Bob. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Heather. Okay. Thanks, Heather.